Today's Bible reading is Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 28 through 15 to 18. Yes. At the end of every three years, bringing all the tithes of that year's produce, bring all the tithes of that year's produce and store it in your towns. So that the Levites, who have no allotment or inheritance of their own, and the foreigners, the fatherless, and the widows who live in your towns may come and eat and be satisfied. And so that the Lord your God may bless all the work of your hands. At the end of this, every seven years, you must cancel debts. This is how it is to be done. Every creditor shall cancel any loan they have made to a fellow Israelite. They shall not require payment from anyone among their own people, because the Lord's time for cancelling debts has been proclaimed. You may require payment from a foreigner, but you must cancel any debt your fellow Israelite owes you. However, there need be no poor among you. For in the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess as your inheritance, he will richly bless you. If only you fully obey the Lord your God and careful and are careful to follow all these commands I'm giving you today. For the Lord your God will bless you as he has promised, and he will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. You will rule over many nations, but none will rule over you. If anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns of the land the Lord your God has given you, is giving you, do not be hard hearted or tight fisted towards them. Rather, be open handed and freely lend them whatever they need. Be careful not to harbour this wicked thought. The seventh year, the year for cancelling debt, is near, so that you do not show ill will toward the needy among your fellow Israelites and give them nothing. They may then appeal to the Lord against you, and you will be found guilty of sin. Give generously to them, and do so without a grudging heart. Then, because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work, in everything you put your hands to. There will always be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed towards your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. If any of your people, Hebrew men or women, sell themselves to you and serve you for six years, in the seventh year you must let them go free. And when you release them, do not send them away empty-handed. Supply them liberally from your flock, your threshing floor and your wine press. Give to them as the Lord your God has blessed you. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. That is why I give you this command today. But if your servant says to you, I do not want to leave you because he loves you and your family and is well off with you, then take an owl and push it through his earlobe into the door and he will become your servant for life. Do the same for your female servant. Do not consider it a hardship to set your servant free because their service to you these six years has been worth twice as much as that of the hired hand and the Lord your God will bless you in everything you do. Thanks, Anita. Thanks, Janet. Thanks, everyone. The musos, the AV guys that are all... Takes a lot of people to to put a service on, so thank you, and thanks as Janet's already said for all those involved in the high tea making that wonderful event happen. It sounded good. We had a great speaker. It looked really good. We had all the decorations and and the yes, the the guys serving looked good, but there was something there that I think was even more impressive. The fact that so many, I don't know, I think something between a third and a half, the ladies that were there were invited. And that is brilliant. That is what it's all about. But it doesn't end there, does it? You know, we we operate from this idea of a pathway of bringing people along. So if you invited um, one of your friends, family along last Sunday, and they enjoyed the high tea, ask them something like, what did you think of the speaker? What she had to say. 
see where that conversation goes. That's what we need to do because it's not just getting them there. We want our family and friends to come and hear the life-saving gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and his forgiveness. So there's more work to do. And um, as you know, we've got operating right now. We started last week, Christianity Explored. Um, you can start this Tuesday if you'd like. But just keep that in mind or keep it in mind next time we run Christianity Explored. Develop the, the attitude of invitation. Ask a simple question like, what did you think? And, uh, and offer another invitation perhaps to Christianity Explored or to something else where they might learn more about the Lord. The next thing is that um, I apologise, but I forgot. <laughs> I forgot to ask council to give us some more time this week for our meeting, which is going to happen right after. And it's going to happen really quickly right after because of that. <laughs> So we're going to have to get your coffee pretty quick and assemble back in here. Everyone's invited to the congregational meeting, whether you're a member or not. Um, so we're going to have to move pretty quick. And I apologise to whoever's on morning tea. I normally try and slow it down so they can join the meeting, but we're just going to have to move pretty quick today. I apologise for that. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your word each week as we, as we reflect on its wonder and its relevance to us. We ask, Lord, today again that you bless us as we, as we dig into it, with the result being that we are built up and become more like you. In your precious name, amen. How good and generous is our God? Obviously not Pentecostal. Okay. <laughs> he put us on that. That's what I like to hear, yeah. He put us on this small blue planet with beauty and abundance. He has known us before time. He knitted us together in our mother's womb. How wonderful is that? He knows when we rise, when we lie down. He created this world of plants and animals for food to sustain us. He has revealed himself in the Bible and he has called us through his son into relationship with himself. And so we have the astounding privilege to know, to love, to enjoy, to talk to, to serve, and even be filled with the Lord God of all, the creator, the sustainer, the savior, and judge of the universe. How amazing and good is our God. <laughs> That's a way. But do you trust him? The Christian life could be described as coming to that liberating realization that it's not all about you. The lifelong Christian process of sanctification, becoming more Christ like, that is is to constantly remove ourselves from the center of our universe and put Christ at the center. So all that we do and say and think revolves around him. According to Romans 12, we are to offer our lives as a living sacrifice of worship and service to him. When we know the Lord is good, 
so that we trust and obey him, we discover something. We discover that we have positioned ourselves to receive his extraordinary blessing. That is what he promises throughout the Bible and very powerfully in this passage today. Moses is continuing in his long speech about how Israel is to live when they get over that promised land they're looking at just there to the west, a few kilometres away. Living in such a way that they will receive the Lord's blessing. And central to living the sort of life that God can bless is how we treat others. In chapter 14, Moses has been talking about the importance of tithing. In the case of Israel, that was pretty much setting aside one-tenth of all the produce uh, in the fields for that year. Then in verse 28, he says, At the end of every three years, bring all the tithes of that year's produce and store it in your towns so that the Levites, who have no allotment or inheritance of their own, and the foreigners, the fatherless, and the widows who live in your towns may come and eat and be satisfied And so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. The Levites were a tribe of Israel that served in the place of worship. Unlike the other tribes, they did not have an allocation of land. They were to live off the tithes and offerings that the people brought to the place of worship or every three years as we see what they stored up in their towns. But this provision is also for foreigners living in Israel. It's for the fatherless and the widows. As the people gave one-tenth of their produce or their income, other people were supported and blessed. But there's more to it than that. Because when the tithe is given, verse 29, the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands also. In chapter 15, more areas are added to this idea of generous giving to others and receiving the Lord's blessing. God gave Israel this remarkable Sabbath principle of the Sabbath rest. We see it first in Genesis 1, where God rested on the seventh day of creation. It's instituted in the Ten Commandments. Leviticus 25 goes into great detail of how that was practiced. It's again here in Deuteronomy. And it's in New Testament books, particularly Hebrews. Israel was to operate on a seven-day cycle with one day of Sabbath to worship the Lord and to rest. They were also to operate on a seven-year cycle. The seventh year was a Sabbath year, and the ground was to rest. It was not to be worked or sown with seed. They had to trust the Lord for that year to eat what grew naturally. And then after seven cycles of seven years, the 50th year was to be a year of jubilee. And on this year, all the land that had been bought, swapped and sold at, in those previous 50 years was now returned to the original family. There is so much more to this idea of Sabbath than simply not working. It includes this radical social and economic practices that result in the Lord's blessing. 
15.1. At the end of every seven years, you must cancel debts. This is how it is to be done. Every creditor shall cancel any loan they have made to a fellow Israelite. They shall not require payment from anyone among their own people. Why? Because the Lord's time for cancelling debts has been proclaimed. Trusting and obeying the Lord's social application of Sabbath generosity would make poverty obsolete or at least make it very short term within that seven years. Loans that people gave were to assist those that had fallen on hard times rather than enrich the lender, and there was to be no interest charged. The nation was to cooperate as a family, not act as rivals. The lender knows that the land was the Lord's. That's his motivation. And the Lord had gifted it to everyone that it might be stewarded for the benefit of all. This radical economic grace reflects the Lord's radical, gracious commitment to Israel. Various laws were made so that foreigners were to be cared for and protected. Yet in verse 3, we see that cancelling debts was optional for them. Lots of reasons behind that. They didn't own land. They were probably merchants and various things. It doesn't mean that you could not offer them debt relief. But then Moses adds this interesting point in verse 4. There should be no poor among you, for the Lord your God will richly bless you. If only you fully obey the Lord your God and are careful to follow all these commands I am giving you today. For the Lord your God will bless you as he has promised. So if the people of Israel fully obey the Lord, the individual and also the nation, will be richly blessed. And the next few verses outline the attitude the people need toward one another to receive God's blessing. If anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns of the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward them. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. Be careful not to harbour this wicked thought. The seventh year, the year for cancelling debts is near, so that you do not show ill will toward the needy among your fellow Israelites and give them nothing. Naturally, you're going to hesitate to give out a loan in that last year, which may not be repaid, aren't you? To lend in that sixth year is practically to give a gift, not alone. But it's precisely this kind of generosity that was being asked of Israel in trust and obedience to the Lord in following out this Sabbath year principle. See, obedience to the Lord inevitably results in generosity of your time, talent, treasure, whatever it may be. But we see that a mean spirit can result in the poor appealing to the Lord, verse 9. They may then appeal to the Lord against you. 
and you'll be found guilty of sin. What is that sin? Being mean. Not being generous there. Therefore, verse 10, give generously to them and do so without a grudging heart. Then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed toward your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. But wait, there's even more. The Sabbath year was also a time to free servants. Verse 12, if any of your people, Hebrew men or women, sell themselves to you and serve you six years, in the seventh year you must let them go free. A person who is going through a tough time could offer themselves in service to another. That's how it worked in ancient Israel. Well, it was supposed to work like that, I should say. This was not intended to be a permanent relationship. The servant is not owned by the master. Israelites were never to become slaves of other Israelites. It's a very different model than to the idea we may have in our heads about slavery as we have seen it, for example, in North America, places like that. Verse 13, and when you release them, do not send them away empty-handed. Supply them liberally from your flock, your threshing floor, and your winepress. Give to them as the Lord, has your God, has blessed you. And this is important. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. That is why I give you this command today. And verse 18, do not consider it a hardship to set your servant free. And the Lord your God will bless you in everything you do. Verses 16 and 17 there describe a situation uh, where that person loves the family and they want to stay serving there. Obviously, they're treated well. And there's a good, mutually beneficial relationship there. But as we read through that passage, have you seen what happens as they trust and obey the Lord in being generous to others? If a person gives their tithe to help others, the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. If they cancel the debts of the poor, the Lord your God will richly bless you if only you fully obey the Lord your God. For the Lord your God will bless you as he has promised and you will lend to many nations but borrow from none. And if you give generously without a grudging heart, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. A person is to liberally supply their freed servant as the Lord your God has blessed you. Consider it a joy to set your servant free and the Lord your God will bless you in everything you do. Do you see a pattern here? What's the pattern?
lots of ways to describe it, I suppose. Gibbs could simply say, give to receive. Well, blessed to give to receive. But these are not easy things to do. These things are very costly. God commands them to stop work one day a week. And he commands them to stop working or very limited work in your fields. One year out of seven. And then while you're not sort of earning an income, he says, well, that, then I want you to give 10% of the produce that you have. And then I want you to give generously to the poor. And then I want you to give up chasing the money that's rightfully owed to you. And then I want you to give away the productive labor that you have. And after you've done that, then you receive a blessing. Wasn't that simple, was it? There's always a whole lot of self-interest. Whether it was 1400 BC or 2024, fighting against us trusting and obeying the Lord, is there not? So what is going to get you over the line to be a person who is obedient in being sacrificially generous? I think what might help is if we ask ourselves two questions. Do I really believe God is good and generous? Now, your reaction for when I began describing how generous and good God is shows that... <laughs> Do I really believe... Read something the other week, can't remember where, but, but, you know, if we lack God's goodness, if we, if we think that God is not so good, it's really scary for how we're going to react. See, deep down, if you doubt that God is really good, your eyes will move off him. And you will find yourself standing next to Eve in the garden, looking up and desiring that big, juicy, delicious piece of fruit, whatever that fruit is for you, and look at that for your satisfaction, for your self-worth, for your comfort, for your pleasure for your enjoyment if we don't think God is good. The next question related to it is to ask ourselves: do I really trust him? Trust that there is so much more going on than just some annoying person here asking me for help or for some money when that happens. Trust that in the Lord's sovereign reign over the universe, including my life, he has brought this person, this circumstance into my life. And at that point when we're confronted with a need, if I can remember that it's not about me and my stuff, if I can remember that the Lord is good 
and trust that the Lord operates on a far bigger stage than I can imagine, my attitude will be transformed in that situation. Because another's need now becomes to me an opportunity to bless, not a pain in the neck. As I give my time, talent, treasure, whatever it may be, it may create something far more valuable than that time or money I actually gave. It may create a chance to have a conversation about the Lord if I pause to give. The Bible tells us it may be an angel that you have hosted. How's that one? (laughs) What it is, is an Ephesians 2.10 moment. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. As God's holding you and blessing you, reach out to help another. Your generosity to others is also an opportunity for you to step out and trust the Lord to supply your needs. But let's keep a few things in mind. God is not a slot machine, and I am not a televangelist. (laughs) If you give $50 today, by 3 p.m. next Friday, you're going to have $500. (laughs) That's not what I'm saying. (laughs) That has more to do with me remaining at the centre of my universe and God performing for me. I am not preaching a prosperity gospel. But I do believe and I know that the Lord blesses obedience. But I also know that may not always be material, financial. It could be a blessing in your marriage. It could be a blessing in other relationships. It could be a blessing in your health. It could be fruit from your service. Or it may not. For 35 years, every month, In the mail, I get a newsletter from the Voice of the Martyrs. I call it my monthly reality check. And because of that, I know that last year, just in Nigeria, over 4,400 Christians were killed for their faith. They literally gave everything. Are they blessed? The Bible does tell us that the Lord has something even better for them. Hebrews 11. The Bible tells us in Revelation that they will receive a special crown in heaven with an eternity of blessing for their faithfulness. God does have their lives in his sovereign plan for ultimate blessing in a ways we won't know till we get there. And sometimes it might be us that are the ones calling for blessing from others' generosity. So blessing is mysterious on one hand, but 
immensely practical on the other. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. You wouldn't normally think that. Blessed are those who mourn. Doesn't seem to make sense. In God's economy, it does. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, he says. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it will find that abundant life in Christ and serving him. Stepping out into what can feel like cross-carrying, uncomfortable obedience, is that place where we receive blessing, if we are willing to go there. What makes it uncomfortable is that so much of what the Bible teaches is the polar opposite to what our society values and teaches. So instead of affirming our desire for comfort, security, independence and entertainment, Jesus demands the opposite from his followers. Because those things are not going to build God's kingdom. And they tend to put you in a place outside of God's blessing. And do you know what? Tragically, that is exactly what Israel did. Do you know, despite what we've just read, despite the command of the Lord to bring tithes, to be generous, to forgive debts, to set slaves free, to return the land, and in doing so receive God's blessing, there is no biblical or historical evidence that they ever did. But thankfully, the Lord never forgot like they did. He still wants to forgive, to restore, to set things right, and to bring blessing into our lives. And so when Jesus begins his ministry, in Luke, he quotes Isaiah, declaring, the spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. That is the same as the year of Jubilee. Everything's going to be put back right. And you know what? We have the astounding privilege to continue to proclaiming this message of Jesus today. If I know and love the Lord, the greatest thing that I can give, that I can give others, is the gospel. Am I stingy about that? Not that interested, perhaps? Or am I generous in seeking opportunity for that? There are so many opportunities to be generous with our time, talent, treasure in the life of our church. Lots of jobs, 
need to be done, need help with. In a few weeks, we're going to hear Wayne from Abermain Mission Hall. He is the founder of Soupson that operates in Cessnock. He's going to share about the amazing work that he's doing and the two new initiatives that he's got. And you know what? He's recruiting. <laughs> so there's another opportunity to be generous. What is the thing then? So if I'm going to be generous, it's preceded by two things, I think. Knowing that God's good and trusting him then I can be generous. So what builds our knowledge of the Lord's goodness and our trust in him so that we might step out in this active, sacrificial obedience and generosity? Well, I think looking at his track record is a good place to start as we read in the Bible. Seeing also how he's worked in history in people's lives since the Bible was written and also remembering the blessing that he has brought into your lives that's a good place to learn to trust him and to see his goodness i've said to liz that we should write a book of the lord's abundant blessing he has poured out into our lives there are so many stories I could share, but, but I, I, I'm going to choose this one because I think you can relate to it because many of you have seen it. You've sat in it. Before we were married and ever since, we've always tithed. It's just a thing. It's just a simple decision. And the Lord has blessed that. Before coming to Cessnock, we spent one year on one wage and over eight years with no wages as we studied and we served in different ministries. And the Lord always supplied our needs and much more. When we arrived in Cessnock, the church could afford to pay three days a week. Getting paid each week was really strange. <laughs> it was amazing being so long. Though at the time, most of that went on rent, but that was okay. And then we saw a block of land, Nolkaba. I could write a whole chapter on how we got that. But let me just summarise all that and say that we bought a block of land in Nolkabar for 60% less than the equivalent blocks going in Nolkabar at the time. The concreter gave me his invoice for all the concrete you don't do that. <laughs> you put your mark up on it. That's how you make your money. And he just said to me, Steve, you just pay it direct. That saved 20% at least. The supplier of the funny blocks that my house is made of, if you've seen it, said to me, if you can get them out of the yard by June 30, you can have them for half price. And then Bill provided a place for me to store them. Way back then at the time, the parquetry floor was going for about $90 a square metre back then. I found the exact quantity I needed at an auction. Another long story short, I offered $22 a square metre. It was a, not a in their auction, it was a weird auction, but they had to ring up, but it was still an auction. 
That was my bid. They rang me back that afternoon and they said, yeah, it's yours. But if you can get it out of here quickly, you can have it for $20. How's that? <laughs> Does that happen? <laughs> there are so many more stories I could tell you about that house, about the timber lintels, about Tassie oak for 40 cents a metre. <laughs> Crazy. You can never outgive God. We step out in faith. He's got us. And every day as I worked on that house, I prayed, Lord, this is your house. May you use it. And may people come to know you in it. And the Lord has answered that prayer. Even on Tuesday night, Christian explored. Just thrilled that 15 people are sitting around in our living room wanting to know more about Jesus. How good is that? So when you visit next time, just remember, you are standing in a testimony to God's faithfulness, goodness, and miraculous blessing. May that encourage you to know he is good and then to trust him and then to obey generously. And may the Lord bless you as you do so. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, that you are such a generous God. Thank you that you are faithful to us. And thank you, Lord, that you put before us that challenge of stepping out in faith. To be a bit uncomfortable, a bit nervous, a bit risky, a bit unorthodox, to get the raised eyebrows from our family, perhaps. <laughs> but to do that, because we know you are good, because we learn to trust in your goodness, and because we want to see your kingdom grow and others come to know what we know.